What is your perspective? What is your analysis of the six days of events that we have seen? Well, I don't think it's a model of an air crash investigation. Uh, and the news of the day in terms of the now there's this conflicting story from the Wall Street Journal about there was data from the engine. Yes. That would be expected, and, and that would be reasonable to expect, but the Malaysian authorities are saying, of course, that they don't have it. What has to happen on day one, and I give credit to the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, they do this. When something happens, the team, there's the go team out going to the crash site, but there's a team you never hear about which goes to the airline or the manufacturer or both and grabs all the maintenance and aircraft records and the piloting records. The records here are unbelievably important, and for Malaysia to say they didn't have this data from Rolls-Royce is really pretty shocking. Right. Within that, how can the United States assist Malaysia right now as they go to the morning in eight or ten hours? Well, the way to assist would be to help them in the civil investigation. I think the, the military role is, is, you know, in other countries that plays a big role, but in a civil airliner uh, crash, it is, a, it is a civil investigation. I think the NTSB could help them by literally showing them the way uh, to do a modern investigation. They've had several crashes, but, you know, the U.S. has more experience than anyone else, and that would really help. You know, Boeing's a party to the investigation because it was a Boeing plane, and they are very experienced in investigations, and, and frankly, they should be coordinating with them as well. They, they know right. what to do. There's a lot of coordination going on between the dozens of countries that are involved here, and lots of theories as well, because there's no real uh, hard evidence about what happened. What theory makes sense to you? Is there a theory that makes sense to you on why this yes. modern passenger jet disappeared without a trace? Well, you know, it, it really didn't. I think that they're probably looking in the wrong place. A modern, this modern jet, and, and you know, the 777 is a great plane, but it has to be maintained properly, and you have to know, you know, and you have to track it. You have to know what's going on. The terrorism and the hijacking scenario doesn't make any sense to me because of the reaction of the countries. Malaysia didn't believe it. They said their country was heading back into the airspace if it was hijacked or uh, uh, it was uh, you know, right. a terrorism plane. They just allowed it to overfly it. Same thing with Vietnam. If they had an in-flight accident right where it left, it, it went off radar and the transponder went off, I think it actually just could no longer transmit, that would make the most sense. And then the question becomes, did the plane go down? Now they say they found nothing there, so you know it didn't go down there because there's nothing there to find. Then the plane went on, which is what the 777 does. The 777 fights to fly. If it's losing systems, it shuts down unnecessary systems and keeps its control surfaces and its engines. That's what a 777 does. So I think that most likely it had a catastrophic mechanical event and it flew on. Mm -hmm. Mary, you made your name on lousy aircraft parts. I want to ask you a delicate question. I know as a former public official, you've got to be careful. Is there a difference in the mechanical processes and systems of American and developed European economy airlines versus the airlines from emerging markets? Are they one and all in the same, or is there a distinction? No, there's a huge distinction in the part supply chain, and, and we found when we were doing the investigations, and this was back in the, you know, in the mid to late 90s, I mean, the problems we found is a lot of the bad parts and bad maintenance were coming out of Southeast Asia. They were coming out of Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Yeah. And unless the airline's very careful, they can easily get bad parts, particularly jet engine blades, um, jet engine parts, spacers, anything that's very expensive, there's a knockoff for it. So when you fly to Singapore, are you going on a major carrier or do you have confidence with secondary airline carriers? No, and I've written about this extensively. When I fly, no matter where it is in the world, I look for major Western developed nation carriers. And frankly, I always try to buy my tickets in the U.S. and, and, and do U.S. throughout because, you know, we're not, we're not great at everything, but we have address the part supply, the maintenance supply, and we have an, an inspection over overview, an inspection regime that many parts of the world just don't have. Mary, what regulations specifically are in place to ensure that U.S. carriers do not use these uh, cheaper uh, substitute parts? 
Well, it's not even just regulations. There are regulations in place, and you have to, each part that's a critical part has to have its own certification and be approved. But what's most important in the United States is if you use bogus parts, it's a criminal offense. And I think that is one good set of, uh, of deterrence, because if you do it and you knowingly do it, it can carry a prison term, and that's the work that I did. And, Mary, uh, based upon your uh, vast experience uh, dealing with these types of issues, what types of uh, 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 products going into the engines, the aircraft, et cetera, would potentially lead to catastrophic failure? Uh, the turbine blades and the uh, what they call the spacers, right. the, the components that, that keep the combustion com uh, contained in the engine. But often, if you have an engine failure, it's turbine blades. Mary, tell me about the pilots. Tell me about the difference in training that you observed in the United States versus the Southeastern, uh, South Asian carriers that you're criticizing. Are they one and the same, or is there a distinguishing difference? Well, some of the initial training can be the same because, you know, the, because Boeing and, and, uh, and others in the engine, man, engine manufacturers set the basic parameters of what you have to be trained on. But in the United States, we've now put in, and sadly, it's been on the backs of accidents. I mean, we, uh, the saying in Washington was that, that we, uh, we legislate by anecdote. Um, that's why I call the FAA the Tombstone Agency. We kind of made changes after something happened, but... We have better crew rest rules now. We have more required training, actual hands-on training for what they call upset events. We require more crew resource management, meaning the pilots have to challenge each other. We don't allow guests right. in the cockpit like we saw yesterday. We don't allow smoking, and, and there's supposed to be no chatter and chit-chat and nonsense in the cockpit, and that right. is different. 